My name is Inke Arns. I'm the director of uh, HMKV, Hardware Medienkunstverein. And uh, since uh, mid-September, we have this exhibition up and running by Fiona Banner, also known as the Vanity Press. And uh, I'm extremely happy to welcome you, the audience, um, as well as our guests, the artist Fiona Banner, also known as the Vanity Press, and the writer Tom McCarthy which are connected to each other and actually also to me through various and complex links which we will try to uncover for you tonight. Um, I will introduce both of them in a minute. This year I had the pleasure to curate the Pavilion of Kosovo at the 59th uh, Venice Biennale and it was there in Venice that I discovered Fiona Banner's exhibition, Pranayama Typhoon, which took place at the gymnasium of Patronato Salesiano, a children's basketball court set within a converted church. This exhibition literally blew me away. It is the exhibition that we are in right now, here at uh, HMKV, HMKV in Dortmund. So let me brief you, briefly uh, tell you about the exhibition. Um, the, the title of this exhibition combines the word pranayama, an ancient breathing technique, with the word typhoon, an overwhelming and increasingly frequent natural phenomenon, which is also the name of a state-of-the-art fighter plane. In this solo exhibition, uh, the artist presents, among other works, the video Pranayama Organ, which we have just seen from 2021, which features two full-scale inflatable military decoy aircraft, a Typhoon and a Falcon. At dawn, the two fighter airplanes come to life, accompanied by the grandiose or pathetic sound of a church organ. Bean bags you're sitting on, Beanbags in the form of life-size aircraft parts invite visitors to linger while a real fighter jet behind you slowly fills with air and collapses again. So um, you could tell, uh, you have noticed that there's a lot about wind, there's a lot about breathing, there's a lot of air. And actually the song that we are uh, that we heard in the video is uh, Wild is the Wind, um, which was composed, uh, the music was composed by Dimitri Tjomkin. Um, and that's a really interesting connection. I have to tell this, I'm sorry. It's a really interesting connection to, to my work, actually, because Tjomkin, he's actually a Ukrainian-born American composer. He was born in St. Petersburg. Um, at the end of the 19th century, and he composed the music for also for the storming of the Winter Palace. So, um, oh, I don't have the book here, but um, maybe some of you remember that in 2017 we had this big exhibition on the sixth floor dealing with the famous photograph of the storming of the Winter Palace uh, from 1920. So it's very interesting that through actually the composer, there's, uh, there's a link uh, to the work we have been doing here. So Fiona Banner, also known as the Vanity Press, is an artist uh, born in 1966 who lives and works in London, UK. Her work explores gender, language and publishing through a range of mediums, including drawing, sculpture, performance and the moving image. The struggle between language and its limitations is central to Banner's work. She often works under the moniker of the Vanity Press. She, she established the imprint in 1997 uh, with her seminal book, The Nam, which of course refers to Vietnam. Since then, she has published many works, some in the, in the form of books, some sculptural, some performance-based. And uh, in 2009, she issued herself an ISBN number 
and registered herself as a publication under her own name. Um, maybe you don't know, but usually it's very complicated to get an ISBN number, so I'm curious what she could tell us about the process tonight, maybe. So, Tom, our second guest tonight, he is a writer who recently relocated from London to Berlin. We met in Berlin in the 1990s when Tom was appearing as General Secretary of the International Necronautical Society. Maybe some of you remember the black box that was included in the exhibition Awake Are Only the Spirits in 2009. That was actually a work by the INS. I was so much carried away by his first novel, Remainder, that we decided to include a chapter of it in the publication History Will Repeat Itself uh, in 2007. One of the many things I think that connect us, uh, I guess, is the fact that we both were avid readers of Hergé's Tintin, Tintin, Emilou, of the comics in German, Tim und Struppi. Tom has even written a book about it, uh, whose title sounds like one of Hergé's comic books, Tintin and the Secret of Literature. Tom's award-winning fiction explores and extends the realm of narrative possibility and is characterized by his interest in the relationship between technology and reality. He published, for example, uh, the novel C in 2010 and uh, his latest novel, The Making of Incarnation, I think 2021, right? Uh, it was published in 21, which I still have to read. An ongoing dialogue with other artists and thinkers drives McCarthy's work. Together with uh, Fiona Banner, they wrote a no play published in our publication, which is available in the exhibition for free. And in uh, 2022, so this year, at the end of this year, he is curating the exhibition Holding Pattern in Oslo's Künstnerne Hus which in early 2024 will travel to HMKV here in Dortmund. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion we are going to have, to the dialogue you are going to have. I, if I remember correctly, we will talk about language, we will talk about faith, Glauben, we will talk about typography and landscape, very interesting issue. And also, I think we will encounter a pieta. Um, curious what this is going to be. So the structure um, is like uh, Fiona and Tom, you are going to have a dialogue. We might be moving through the exhibition. That's why we have wireless microphones. Um, and I think we would also be happy about uh, audience involvement questions. And I'm sure there will be answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the whole event will last about uh, one and a half hours. And so we try to watch the, the time a little bit. So over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Inke. It's always a pleasure to be here. This is the first time I've seen the new new building, it's great. Um, so yeah, I thought maybe we could start, I wanted to read you, Fiona, a little bit of your own or the institution's, but I, I, I hear your hand in it, statement about these paintings around the wall, which are seascapes with syntax, with punctuation, with commas and full stops and dot, dot, dot ellipses in them. So the institution, you, together, right, you write, these anti-texts were ways of exploring a crisis in Banner's own language. Here they are deployed to investigate a wider crisis of language and communication. Nature in crisis, language 
adrift on the precipice. Some paintings about the gulf, comma, between words, period, and action, period. Some paintings that know that the sea is the bottom line, comma, that understand that turning a page is reminiscent of a wave, and that a chapter is the tide, period. Some paintings that are a channel, hyphen, all paintings are a channel, period. Some paintings that understand that the channel is not only a conduit, but also a barrier, ellipsis. It's, I mean, it's a very, I reminds me of William Burroughs or something, it's a wonderful kind of cut up piece of writing. But I think, you know, this is where I want to start. There's an intimate, complex, and very interesting relation in your work between landscape and language. So maybe we could start by talking about that. It's uh, the piece, the quote that you've read at the end where the punctuation is cited as um, within the verbal stream of language is um, part of an ongoing performative relationship that I feel I have with language, but also with the sort of structure of how we navigate and negotiate um, art uh, within the institution and, you know, amongst ourselves. We're now here in this absurd act of um, <laughs> uh, conversation around um, work that's happened because conversation isn't possible. And um, as Inka mentioned earlier, this absurdist um, text, this in conversation between you and I, um, was written as a stand-in for a gallery guide because we realized the sort of uh, implausibility of uh, really uh, describing um, the work in, uh, through the means of conventional conversation. Um, with the paintings um, that you've referred to, I guess I was the starting point was a uh, an interest in <laughs> how uh, in, interest in my own failure really around um, language and how it was uh, failing failing me, but also becoming, I suppose, in that moment more and more present. Um, so I started making a series of sculptures uh, around uh, the notion of an artist block, a, a sort of um, loss of content or knowing where to, uh, how to proceed within my own practice. And um, those sculptures um, were, took the form of full stops from different fonts. So a Helvetica font is like a sort of block, um, avant-garde, is like a, a podium, the small painting over there on the wall is an ellipsis and that's three avant-garde full stops, yeah. So, um, uh, as language was my medium, the, um, the sort of loss of a medium or disenfranchisement with my own medium became uh, an investigation into a sort of absence around language and I started to think of these full stops as very sort of present sculptural um, characters because the uh, disenfranchisement I was experiencing around language uh, I was feeling in quite a visceral um, physical way so that's where the um, the full stop works uh, w works began and then also I suppose that kick-started another narrative around this tiny little speck on a page that is normally a breath, a sort of performative again moment in terms of reading um, and um, well I've lost my thread, but, <laughs> no, but I think it's I'll take a breath. You start, you mentioned, you know, your early language pieces were like the NAM. You just describe the whole film. It's very fluent. It's all these words flowing. And as time progresses, as your career progresses, it gets more and more disjointed. You're not doing the words now. You're doing the interruptions, the breaks, the stops, the gaps. There's this kind of performed, yeah, breaking down. Yeah, I, th I, th I think it, it's... Um, 
you know, also uh, uh, as this text uh, implied, I became aware that it was a wider problem <laughs> than my own <laughs> personal problem. And um, uh, there is a uh, universal crisis of, of language taking place um, politically and um, in terms of uh, uh, international politics and conflict and uh, our ability to deploy language for its so-called potentially uh, uh, that Heidegger idea of drawing everyone together into a assembly of joy and I mean Heidegger has his own problems but yeah. you're, you're, you're like the opposite you know yeah. it's, it's about the yeah the, the break I mean with the full stops after doing the paintings you physically made them and put them in the channel after Brexit between Britain and yeah. Europe I mean yeah. it's, it's moving off the page into yeah. physical space to to not even represent but to kind of embody this kind of catastrophic Break but as yeah. far as I understood this, this was part of an action against uh, uh, disruptive fishing, fishing right? Also, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, just to explain to to uh, uh, some people here in the audience, so Fiona produced a really huge stone sculptures, granite sculptures, uh, full stops, like on these paintings but in different fonts. And so um, I think as, as far as I read in uh, Joanna Pocock's text, um, uh, she positioned two of those sculptures in on the Dogger Bank. It's a, it's a kind of shallow place in between uh, the UK and uh, the continent um, in order to, as part of a larger barrier, um, uh, in order to uh, avoid or to fight uh, um, schleppnetz fishing, yeah, uh, ground drag, drag tra nets. trawling, yeah. uh, which is illegal actually, and so this is part of a you know a kind of ecological activism, I would say, no? Yes, um, through a sculptural act. Um, yeah. So the the two um, large granite full stops, um, one um, from the font Orita and one from the font Peanuts were deployed from the Greenpeace boat, the Esperanza, meaning hope, um, into the Dogger Bank and the Dogger Bank is where um, Britain in the last ice age was connected to mainland Europe. So uh, in and of itself, a, um, a potent piece of water, but also um, uh, a very um, fragile natural habitat for all, all sorts of um, sea life that's being um, destroyed through highly destructive um, industrialized bottom trawler trawling fishing. So these full stops actually did become obstacles mm -hmm. in that they snag the nets of the bottom trawlers and that area is now now actually as of um, earlier in the year being declared a no-go zone for bottom trawler fishing. So I mean I guess that the idea of the full stops in that instance were that um, they were also calling out a duplicity around language because the government had been saying um, that they were going to stop, put an end to this kind of fishing, but had never really had the balls to do that or weren't standing by their words. So it was sort of a notion of uh, the slipperiness of language that, that came into it. And, that, you know, I, I, part of this um, quote around um, uh, the that Tom read around um, the the sea being the bottom line being the bottom line is mm -hmm. because those uh, full stop sculptures now exist on the bottom line, which is the seabed, and you know they are for for squid, not quid. They're they're there the to fish are the audience. Yeah, because you had originally wanted to have them floating like a a buoy, a buoy, <laughs> and then you just had them sinking like well, 
Yeah, yeah so m my initial idea years ago was to make these um, uh, buoy-like sculptures in the shape of um, full stops also in the channel and um, that didn't happen for all sorts of complex logistical reasons and that's when I started making these paintings um, of the full stops at sea taking on this idea of really what is an event is an event something happening is an event potentially fictive it what is a documentation um, what is you know how wh what language through what language do we create a fact um, so I, I in a way quite p playfully started collecting these um, big paintings um, at junk shops and so on and so forth of, of boats that were really not paintings of the sea at all. They had big um, seafaring vessels, war boats, galleons in them and then I painted out the galleons and put in the full stops as if this action of mine had happened. But then curiously, uh, seven or eight years later, it did happen yeah. with the Greenpeace action. I love the sense, I mean, <clears throat> you know, Inca mentioned the, the Vanity Press, which is you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I, I love the sense that you turn the sea into a publishing project and you turn yourself into a publishing project, which of course is impossible, but that you did it nonetheless. I mean, you kind of said you got these ISBNs, which, which you buy on license, and then you said, okay, it's me, I am the book, and you submitted the idea that this was you to the Library of Congress or British Library or whoever. I mean, there's something, I, I mean, there's something very funny and very kind of silly <laughs> in a wonderful way, because yeah. it's impossible. I mean, vanity, there's the word vanity for, um, to explain to a German audience, the a vanity publishing is when nobody else will publish, so you pay with your own money to publish your own novel. It's, it's vain, it's, it's, like, it's narcissistic, but it's also um, umsonst, you know, in vain. And of course, in art history, we have, in visual art, we have the whole history of the vanitas, you know, which is always about death, the skull. Think of Holbein's ambassadors, where, I don't know, maybe you'd like to reflect on this kind of cluster of, you know, vainness, in vain, narcissism, yeah. you know, something that doesn't work and so on. Well, firstly, I don't agree that vanity publishing is any more narcissistic than any other um, creative practice. Um, and in many ways, uh, I think what an artist does is vanity publishing, which is to say that you make your work whether somebody wants it or not. And um, so I would stand with that as an act of faith for all the small and big vanity publishers <laughs> in the world <laughs> sort of self-publishing if you like um and and i guess i then i started to think um about the act of um exhibiting work as being much like the act of publishing and realized that really that's what i was engaged with was um creating and publishing material and as i'd been involved in making um books that was a natural uh, natural progression and uh, like many dimensions of my work it was a deadly serious joke <laughs> so yes it's you know uh, for instance publishing myself under, under my own name as, as a book, as a publication, and going through all the rituals, um, ritual and um, bureaucracy associated with that um, is a joke, but it's also a, a performative act of publishing that, uh, to me, perhaps takes on some of the absurdity around uh, m myths of... Uh, self-narrative or um, biography, the, the suggestion even that we are, um, of, 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 that there is a history, all of these things um, came, came into that. So, yeah, 
and you're um, bringing in the idea of vanitas is actually just a very clever thing that you've <laughs> that you've done. <laughs> it is it is sort of it is there, I suppose, right. because there is uh, yeah. Well, it's it's kind of present in this work in a weird yeah. tangential way. Oh, for sure. I mean, that whole vine painting, what the ambassadors are doing in the vanitas, they're carving up the world into imperial space that they're going to conquer. And I mean, you mentioned the original picture, the original what these pictures were of when you first bought them before you replaced them with full stops were military ships. I mean, they're, they're not just syntactical ruptures, they're acts of imperial violence, which brings us, it does obviously bring us nicely to Pranayama organ, these fighter planes on the beach. Um, I mean, they are very vain. There's, there's a kind of, they're acting like birds showing their feathers, inflating themselves. But then you also show the tube, the, art, the, the artifice, the mechanism behind, the pump behind the pump, right? <laughs> you show the <laughs> mechanism behind the grandeur. It's, uh, I think there is a critique of a certain type of political or imperial vanity, right? Uh, for sure, that they are um, sort of blown up, yeah. pumped up, posturing um, beasts, oh, and um, that there's, they sort of reveal their own fragility in, yeah. in their hubris, yeah. um, speaks somehow to the uh, pumped up, trumped up, toxic, Uber masculine, uh, territorial, uh, territory obsessed politics of our day, um, and I suppose I wanted to hold a pin up to the <laughs> um, overinflated, um, verbose uh, decoy, um, placebo dimension of. Um, how conflict is played out and represented yeah. uh, in in the film. Uh, the aircrafts are um, actually the, there are two sets of aircraft in in the film. There's um, a, a small version which is costumes that that. Um, were made to emulate the large full-scale um, decoy fighter planes which are used in the military. So the very fact of existence of these decoy fighter planes that are so sort of redolent of massive overblown children's toys and yet actually are active elements of ideological conquest of, um, of conflict um, and in as much are extremely dangerous is, you know, there's an irony there yeah. and um, a contradiction there. And I suppose it's that contradiction that gives the film the energy or yeah. gave me the energy to make the film. Oh, it's also incredibly beautiful. I mean, they're very tender there, right? The planes. I, th I, I, I mean, see the them decoys. as being involved in a sort of um, act of seduction uh, that they have the um, the uh, idea of requiting and coalescing mm -hmm. and um, of uh, coming together, but in that they realize or we realize that they would be um, emasculating the tools of conflict mm -hmm. and they look at their own demise in yeah. that process. So. Um, I suppose there's the vanitas. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but I did want the film to be uh, seductive in some ways and um, sort of a love story gone wrong, if you like, which for me connects to our relationship with this very planet at, at this point in time. Um, so. Uh, the uh, bringing in the song "Wild Is the Wind" was also around that because I see see that song as being about um, not only unrequited love but 
an unrequited, um, impossible, in fact, quest to um, merge with nature and be at one with yeah. nature. Um, you know, life uh, like a leaf clings to a tree. Oh, my darling, cling to me. It's it's it seems to be very um, entwined with the idea of um, the power and fragility. Um, the, the rela the, our relationship with nature yeah. in that way. But this, I guess, I mean, we can't avoid the fact that it's very directly political as well. I mean, it's interesting, you made it kind of after Brexit, and I think you yourself had seen, so after Brexit, when the, the kind of far-right conservative politicians were recircling Churchill's words about we, we will fight them, we will fight them on the beaches, but them wasn't Nazis anymore, it was refugees. I mean, this idea that Britain was under attack and, and this beach where this is filmed is a place where you yourself saw refugees appearing and crowds of angry British people shouting at them. I mean, it's kind of disgusting. Um, but I think, you know, that, that, was, that was kind of you made the film after that, and then by the time you showed it in Venice, the war with Ukraine had begun, which obviously you didn't know in advance, but, but it's, it's, it's kind of impossible to extract the work from these political contexts too, I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, there will always be a political context, and um, uh, certainly in my lifetime, there will always be uh, a conflict, obviously, uh, Ukraine is quite close to home in, in many ways. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I do work, I work, um, I spend, as you said, I work in London and I also work on the south coast, very close to this, the beach where this is, uh, this film was shot. And the fragility of that coast is um, evident in the actual um, geology of it, but also in that it's this uh, uh, bit of channel, with a very quite a narrow bit of channel between us and the ma mainland Europe. So, you know, the suggestion that this waterway is about, is a conduit, yeah. seems somewhat fanciful. Is in increasingly, it seems like a border and a barrier, and um, uh, that's really sad. Yeah. Um, so, I, ob observing that, and then also observing this cliff face falling, Crumbling. literally falling into the sea. And um, that piece of um, beach actually has a ancient uh, petrified forest underneath the seabed. So it felt like it's um, redolent of different ages, different, different coastlines, different, yeah. Yeah, different yeah. times. Yeah. And um, that's why I chose that that place to to shoot the film, I yeah. think. I just want to pick up this word you used a minute ago, decoy. <clears throat> it's a really interesting word. I mean, we found out when we were writing this short play together that it comes from duck cage, decoy, duck cage. So it's for hunting. It's, a, it's, to, it's to trick a bird into thinking there's another bird it can mate with so that the hunter can shoot with. And of course, it's also in military you know, a decoy plane. But I think it also talks to like the origins of art. You know, the famous Greek story about P Paresius and Zoixius, and one makes the decoy fruit for the birds and the other just does the curtain, right? I mean, <laughs> it's, about, it's about seduction through, through art and, and what we will believe, what, what we can be tricked into believing, but then maybe there is a truth in, this belief, and I want to, um, yeah, this idea of faith uh, is, is very interesting. You mentioned it to me on the phone the other day, and I'd, I'd, I'd never th thought of your work in that context, and then you've made this wonderful piece, which is just around the corner, which is, um, it's a hymn, like in church, where it tells you which hymn you're gonna sing, 
but your one is a, a, the, an ISBN number. And it's, you think at first it's a photograph, but it's not. Talking of temporality and history, it's a, it's a half-hour film where the sunlight moves across it, so there's this kind of immersion. And, but I think it's very much about belief, some kind of belief. I mean, how do you understand faith <laughs> in this context? Why did you choose a hymn sheet? You're obviously playing with the idea of... Well, I, you know. I want to come back to the beginning of your question uh, where you talked about disbelief. Yeah. And um, maybe there is some truth in disbelief. I suppose um, the term suspension of disbelief is really interesting to me. Um, so this happens through Hollywood movies, this happens through all sorts of tellings of um, history which, where we kind of know something not to be true yeah. but want to believe it is true the, because it suits yeah. us. There's an emotional, yeah. uh, an, an emotional trigger has been um, flipped. Yeah, it's one of Aristotle's basic principles of theatre. It's like suspension of disbelief. Yeah. It's not that you believe it's true, it's that you suspend disbelief. Yeah, it. yeah. exactly. And um, for instance, Inca's uh, great story about Dmitry Tompkin and his music being lent to this... Uh, image this sort of apparent staging of the Winter Palace which has got the uh, created the images of that staging have uh, have gone down in history to be uh, the historical they are mistaken they are understood now to be the historical images of that moment whereas the in fact of the Winter Palace yes yeah whereas it was a uh, a decoy another decoy but you weren't know. people actually killed during the filming no, no, no. The filming is something else. So okay. there that were pictures. actually, there was the original event, which was not a storming, but it was uh, the arresting of the provisional government. Uh, that was in 1917. There were no photos, photos of it, right? Then in 1920, for celebrating the third anniversary of the October Revolution, they staged this huge theater spectacle. Uh, a huge mass event, like uh, apparently 100,000 people participated in this as, you know, uh, uh, extras playing the people. Uh, there were stages all around and then the final event would be the storming yeah. uh, of the Winter Palace. That's the pictures we all know. But in the history books, until today, you find them in history books about the October Revolution, you find it as an authentic picture of the 1917 storming of the Winter Palace. And in a way, and, and then in 27, Eisenstein makes his famous movie, October, uh, again, uh, reenacting the reenactment. Mm. So, and in, in, in this very specific case, it's like uh, a theater play becomes a proof for history. Yeah. yeah. This is like what you were saying about the proof of, you create the the record of something having happened yeah. in order to... Yeah. So when you go on Getty Images to buy, you can buy that image. Yes. Um, the storming of the palace. Yeah. And it's considered to be the benchmark reference image yeah. because it it's, has the heroicism and the, the kind of um, grandiosity that we want to associate. It has the heroicism that the original situation didn't have. Exactly. And somehow, you know, uh, Bolsheviki in Russian, of course, means the majority. And so here you finally had an image showing the majority <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> overturning yeah. the minority government. Yeah. And so I think so. Like to come back to your work, there's this really interesting like two-way movement, and you were just saying this now, between debunking on the one hand, like showing the man behind the curtain, making the wizard, you know, showing the pump behind the, the sovereign fantasy of, you know, power on the one hand. But on the other hand, you're not, you're not a nihilist, right? I mean, there is a level of at which belief is valuable, the belief in the value of some process, right? Um, I think belief is the problem. Um, Suspension of disbelief. Yeah, I mean, the pr is the problem. 
but it's also uh, the the AR agency. So obviously, um, there's a conflict there. Um, so I think I do play with that. And something as simple as this hymn board, as you say, usually hangs in a church to announce the um, numbers of the hymns that you're going to sing in a, in a service. Uh, became, I, I, I became interested in the hymn board as a sort of, I don't know, performative prop or indexing system that I don't. Re I can't in entirely decode it. Anyway, yeah. I had one of these hymn boards <laughs> in my studio. Actually, it had started. I remember now because I did a performance in a church, and um, uh, the performance was called Snoopy versus the Red Baron, and I wrote um, Snoopy versus the Red Baron on one hymn board, and then then verses versus. So verses as in song, Poetry, yeah. versus as in um, combat um, on the other one. And I was qu quite interested in um, that there were no, it, they were only, the, the church only had letters. Um, so I had to sort of make this font that, um, they only had numbers, sorry. So I had to make this font in letters to write that anyway. As a result, I had a hymn board in my studio and occasionally in a uh, you know, relatively um, unfocused way would put things up on the hymn board. And then um, one day, because I was making this film that is rather kind of grandiose, and we had this uh, organ recording that I was working on with some friends that we'd recorded in a church um, during the lockdown when the churches were empty, and um, you know, I was I was thinking about the sort of verbosity and grandiosity of the organ and how it makes you feel sort of full but empty. You know, like then yeah. you know the organs of the body yeah. and the the organ of you know the body in many ways and. Um, I just wrote on this hymn board, Dear Bathos, thinking this is all, you know, this film is really pathetic mm. in a way. Because Bathos is like disappointment, let down, isn't it? Well, it, it's... kind of poetic. It, it's, um, it's disappointment it's through disappointment. overambition. Mm. So to me, Bathos is when you sort of push um, the emotional... Uh, Char you deploy the emotional charges with too much confidence and you create a situation that instead of being emotional is actually a letdown. Mm. So in the case of these objects, um, aircraft, instead of being fully inflated, they are empty or yeah. they are sort of weak and floppy. Instead of being erect, they are flaccid. Um, so I think there's uh, a lot in the word bathos yeah. around um, uh, the quest for power and the impossibility of that quest, if you like. Um, so yeah, I wrote Dear Bathos on, on this hymn board um, and then added um, love, full stop, sort of underscore love, full stop. And I realise it's a sort of letter to um, yeah. a letter to us as well, because we've in a sort of state of precarity with our um, with our very uh, world that we live in, where we've created so much fucking amazingness, so much so much growth, so much development, so much extraordinariness, and have such a sort of overblown uh, sense of uh, uh, self-right and celebration around how great our planet is that we've forgotten to uh, look after it. <laughs> yeah. I thought that's pathetic. That's pathetic. <laughs> 
when you study literature, the 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 because bathos is it's yeah it's religious about disappointment, but it's also a rhetorical device. And the classic line you learn is from T. S. Eliot, the line um. The evening is laid out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. So you know, from something romantic and sublime, right back down to the, the yeah. disgusting half dead yeah. body. Um, but yeah, organs. I want to hone in on that word. Home in on that word, organs, because as you said, it's the pipe, it's the church, but it's it's the in this Deleuzean way, the body, the body without the body with all its too many organs gushing out everywhere, and. Um, and it has the innuendo, like sexual organ. And then you have this wonderful line, and we included it in our little play, but you, you, you brought it to the table, to the operating table. This line from um, Conrad Becker, right? The, no, Ernest Becker, from his 1974 study, The Denial of Death, where I haven't read it, but he says at some point, we are gods, but we are gods with anuses. Right? We are gods with assholes. And then there's, there's a, some band, the Flagellants, they made an album. They made an album called Immortality with an umlaut. Immort, Im, oh, immorality, immortality. And they had a song called Gods with Anuses, which you can watch on YouTube. Is um, it good? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's like sub, uh, you know, um, whatever. Yeah, so like Ernest a, Becker. Yes, <laughs> but I like again. You know, Becker. I mean, he's. I looked him up a bit. I mean, he's he's not anti-religious. He just wanted to expand. Like you're expanding what publishing is. He wanted to expand what religion is. He said, we need structures of belief, but it shouldn't just be about you know Jesus and God or whatever. It should be about you know psychoanalysis and Star Wars and. You know everything. I mean, a whole poetics of uh, uh, in in which humanity can function within a belief system. So again, he wasn't a, a nihilist, a kind of a, just a debunker. And I think it's a quite interesting, you know, this idea of. I mean, I think in your work, you know, this this you know, religion, politics, art, systems of they're all kind of it, it beautifully binds it together into these related mechanisms but this as this center i keep coming back to this central question is like what what you know what can one commit to you know well you did ask about faith earlier mm, i mean yeah. i would say uh um making art is an act of faith i mean we do all of us in different ways engage in acts of faith because that's who we are as human shaped beings. Um, I mean, the Becker quote really stuck with me because we build ourselves up, or somehow we need to build these icons. Um, Icons are sometimes uh, art, they're sometimes uh, humans, and um, somehow we need, we, we need to uh, sort of fetishize ourselves in this, in this way. Um, and I mean, I think what, what Becker was getting at with that was with that quote is that we build up these massive, you know, um, omnipotent notions around things, around people, around uh, political moments. And yet, in the end, we are um, just, you know, people, we all have our souls. You know, we're all like, <laughs> it's not, it, it, that as well is a decoy. And um, I guess for him, because he was Jewish and because of the time he was writing, that was a very uh, uh, present, present thought um, or, or important um, meditation uh, to be having. But um, it's, yeah. I mean, he also writes about how, it, there's another quote which I can't recall right now that, that um, stayed with me, though not at this present moment, uh, where he's, um, he's talking about, 
you know, how um, uh, we build these notions of permanence around us, but in fact, we're all just, you know, uh, compost. You know, so it's, it's also part of that, um, that train of thought, I think. Um, uh, quite uh, sort of uh, basically, I also thought that these uh, planes, because they have this, uh, because they're sort of inflated and deflated um, through uh, forced air um, via these um, tubes that um, I started calling like the umbilicus, um, they are. They do sort of have this thing coming out of their ass, and they sort of posture around rather kind of importantly at times. But they've got this sort of weird tube up their ass. <laughs> so that gods with anus is also that's yeah. why it came into our yeah. play, isn't yeah. it? Because we thought it was a laugh, it or was because it was related to the film. Yeah. Shall we? Shall we read a little bit of our play, like one page sure. or something, and then maybe we could see if anyone has some questions or contributions um, so we had the planes are typhoon and falcon which is t and f which is happens to be our initials happily so, so yeah well then t tom uh became the typhoon t and i became the falcon and obviously um they're both forces of nature uh, that rather fancy themselves um, because they're both uh, extremely uh, powerful within their own field um, and also quite destructive. I mean, a, a, a falcon is a, a bird of prey and a typhoon is obviously a very destructive weather uh, phenomenon. Um, and I think something that fed into this is also the relationship with uh, um, the wind throughout with nature, actually, you know, whether it's from the point of view of a uh, of, of falcon or a typhoon. Take it away, typhoon. Oh, and we, it's <coughs> one other thing, we published it with um, loads of notes. Like when you read Shakespeare or Goethe, you get this much text and this much academic notes. So we didn't want to wait 200 years for the professors to write the annotations, so we just wrote them ourselves. <laughs> so most of it, we're not going to read these now, or it would take like uh, hours, Maybe but most of the page is who, who scholarly annotations. Needs, uh, I have more copies if you want, uh, so... Uh. Okay, okay, then we're reading from one, two, three, four. We're reading from page, from act one, okay. One from the, from page three of Act One, I guess. Okay. Um, uh, I can feel the force of history, prehistory, the sediment, the millions of trees and trilobites, the uralites and coprolites and burrows, the trace fossils rising from these palimpsestic sand flats coursing through me. All I see coursing through you is wind, a great column of it. And why not? I'm named after the wind. I'm a typhoon, monsoon trough, knotted wind speed, wild vorticity, hot core and outflow boundary, outflow jets. Oh, jets now. Oh yes, I'm that too. I'm a jet. Stealth fighter, EF-2000, highly agile at both supersonic and low speeds, radar absorbent, roll control, obviously we just took this from the, manu from the military <laughs> website, roll control and pitch control and ailerons and canards, redirecting airflow to my inner elevons or flaps, my cock... Yeah, your cock. My cockpit has wide angle head up display, HUD, helmet mounted symbology system, HMSS, and hands on throttle and stick, H-O-T-A-S, hot ass. You think you've got a hot ass? I can see your pumped umbilicus poking right through it now. You're on an anal ventilator, hot ass my ass. Don't be profane. It's pneuma, artem. It's the breath of 
God. It's whistling, singing choirs, organ thunder. Organs right, pipe bellows flat us. The flats open, the wings lift wide, then fall. Organ music builds and reaches an almost unbearable, verbose pitch. Well, what about you? You've got one too. It's my nom de plume, my fine plumage. It's my sitorial throngs, my upholstery, shimmering in the... You're not a shimmerer, you're a chimera. Up your holstery, indeed. Visibly ruffled. I'm a falcon, a raptor, a bird, a prey, falcon eye. I have foul clasping talons, best eyesight in the kingdom. Bird's eye camera, telephoto eye, eye in the sky. What you lack is perspective. Me, I scan the ringed world as I ride the wind, fastest animal in Earth. I've been recorded at 320 kilometers an hour. Imperial measures, please. Imperial, my butt. Enough already. 240 miles an hour from azure heights. I hover and I dive, my vision tracking, analyzing, passing all the while, my bird brain running, metrics droning, bringing all things into focus. Sure. Yeah, I get it, tooth and claw. You're up for it. So puffed up. Fuck off. Overblown. So bold. So capital. And you're so bloody cursive. Looping, doodling, so italics. That's the end of Act One. And it goes on. Uh, um, yeah. Anyhow, it was great fun to try. <laughs> But maybe, I mean, we should open this discussion up if anyone wants to join in. I know nobody ever wants to be the first, so while the first person, you can be the second. Maybe Inca wants to, to, to you know, do you have, you, I know you well, maybe have things to say, and then anyone else <laughs> ask for the, do you need to ask for the micro, there's, there's a, a microphone, there's a yes, microphone we have an additional here, microphone. So you can wave for the microphone just so that we can record it. Maybe while you're thinking about, uh, you know, questions, it's a really great opportunity. You know, we have Fiona and Tom here with us. So uh, it's the ultimate uh, opportunity. Um, I really enjoyed listening to both of you reading the, the play. It's really, uh, I realized it's meant to be heard and not to be read. That's really super important. What I enjoyed a lot when reading the, the play is actually the fact that one third of the text consists of footnotes. Two thirds. <laughs> Two thirds. <laughs> a lot. Okay, so because it's printed in a in a lower, yeah. yeah, in a smaller, yeah. So I really enjoyed this, and you explained earlier that it's uh, you know um, the kind of uh, you try to control the reading, the future reading of the text. Um, my question was um, when I was reading the play, uh, how much uh, ready-made stuff you integrated into into this kind of absurd dialogue. You said briefly that you used some of some text from the website, a kind of uh, military website, military or website, Wikipedia but, yeah. about the the landscape. But I was wondering how much of the dialogue is actually, you know, uh, uh, stuff that you found, you know, as if you become an organ <laughs> of somebody else speaking. And that well, was my question. We actually wrote it on um, Google Docs because, um, well, there was a pandemic on anyway, but Tom lives in Berlin. I was um, based at the coast at that time. so. It was kind of an act of performative writing, mm. I would say, more than anything else, wasn't it? Yeah. So I think, I mean, this is the first time we've ever read it together. That's true. And I think it would be fun to uh, perform it more and bring in the footnotes. Um, I guess we just wanted to... Uh, bring an idea of fun and performance and if you like sort of sculpturalize the idea of a gallery text um, so it, it 
it's um it's sort of highly fantastical and yet none of it is untrue yeah but it is very much like fat so the the format for it apart from the kind of shakespeare academic printing thing was the japanese no play which are the, these very um stylized form of ancient Japanese theatre with very little movement, just two figures, and they're often reenacting an old story, but every move is coded, codified, in a way the audience would understand. So Yeats recycles this in the early 20th century, often with mythical figures and birds, and Beckett is influenced by that. So Waiting for Godot, where you just have two characters and a desolate space, is coming out of that tradition so we were kind of trying to inhabit that, you know, like, like a found object, like, like the paintings, but just overwriting it with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also, I think, um, uh, make some theater of the, uh, the idea and indeed fact of being stuck, which is a, a big element within the film, um, so. Okay, I'm stepping out of the light to see you better. I, do you have any questions about the, the objects you're sitting on, you know, yeah. the airplane parts? We could also, we can also ask in Deutsch and and sure. Any questions? Uh, any languages are welcome. <laughs> any, any, yeah. I, I could translate French, from Russian. French, anything. Actually. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just a thought. Um, it's a little bit a shame that the uh, airplane is in the gallery. So, um, um, wouldn't Ukraine, the Ukraine, be a bet better place? Um, because, um, well, it's actually used. Yes, as a as an as a fake um, airplane in war, war situations and um, um, I guess they could use some humor, serious humor there or art if you like. What is your opinion about that? Um, when, um, when I first showed this film um, it was in um, in Venice, Italy, uh, in the springtime, and the Ukraine invasion was relatively recent. And I did feel, uh, as Tom can attest, because I had a bit of a falcon-like flap, um, and I felt um, super sensitive or, or su concerned about how the film might um, be interpreted. Um, of course, I stood by it. Uh, and quite a, a lot of Ukrainian people came to Venice and saw the film, um, mainly younger people, actually. And uh, I got incredibly strong feedback from from them about the film, they found it very very emotional by by and large, which was um, well, which was what it was. But um, in terms of humour, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, well, um, not inflated, but inflating and deflating. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because there is there's a lot of posturing on both sides, of course. Um, and um, as uh, an object that speaks of um, actual power and zero power, it it is quite quite a potent uh, quite a potent thing and. Uh, it's uh, it's both a a decoy and an actual thing, an actual um, uh, military element. So yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs>
Good well, comment. For me, uh, talking about these decoy airplanes, um, I, I actually didn't know that they were still in use. You know, I always connected these decoy airplanes with uh, the Second World War. Uh, and I knew about, you know, I heard those stories where, you know, in the, in the UK they put a lot of fake airplanes everywhere so that the Nazis would drop the bombs on those airplanes. Uh, and then, then, of course, it would be the wrong airplanes and the, the real airplanes would still be functional. So um, I was quite astonished that it, it's nowadays it's still possible to buy these. I mean, there's companies who produce these inflatable airplanes. And um, uh, actually, uh, like one month ago, I remember I read uh, some a small news item concerning the Ukraine, where it said that the Ukraine is actually using wooden decoy airplanes. So they have airplanes made from wood. And they're actually very uh, useful because they're very often hit by uh, Russian uh, bombs and, you know, rockets and so on. So, um, yeah. yeah. I see Fiona as a kind of counter-war. I mean, there's a long history of, yeah. from World War I, I mean, Paul Virilio writes about this, the use of art in war, not just to represent war, but to, as you say, to make camouflage and decoy. And then, of course, you have official war artists. And But one thing you did maybe 10, 15 years ago was when you were commissioned to do every year the Tate mu uh, Gallery has a Christmas tree. They invite an artist to make a, an art Christmas tree. And so Fiona's Christmas tree was to get a real military airplane, not a decoy, a real one, and just hang it from the very tall ceiling. And it has the same shape as a... Christmas tree, right? That was almost like a reverse. You were taking a real thing from war, make it, turning it into art. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I suppose in that was also a recognition of how we fetishize these objects of uh, conflict and they become almost these sort of worshipful, um, strange, um, eulogized objects, you know. Um, so, uh, hanging that is upside down like that, as like a sort of uh, something that had been captured. Um, a duck. Yeah, <laughs> back to the decoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, made sense in that instance and then curiously that became a um, quite a, a, a sort of problem that work afterwards because I had this fucking huge like fighter plane. How did you get it? And did you just write to the military <laughs> and say there's no war can you just lend me a plane? <laughs> it, it, yeah it was recently re uh, from a recently it had had all its um, flying Organs. hours removed yeah. <laughs> it did expired its um, yeah. viability but importantly at the time it was still a, a current aircraft yeah so it was a Harrier in that, that that case referring to the Harrier Hawk and I also had a Jaguar uh, as part of the same installation um, and um, yeah I, had, I did loads of research into the life of the planes as well and they were not you know, it wasn't friendly. It was pretty um, uh, intense. And um, so I had to decide what to do with them afterwards. And then um, various sort of uh, private collectors started asking questions around them. And then I realized that was going to be incredibly complicated because they'd be like them re-fetishized as... Mm -hmm. Uh, art. Yeah, yeah, sort of art, bling art object or sort of, uh, you know, very complicated. And um, one of the people that I spoke to about this at the time was Barbara Tum, uh, who's just there, who, who um, runs a gallery and I've, I've worked with for a, f a few decades uh, now. And, and we discussed it. And um, then there was a sort of question, well, where even do we put these aircrafts? 
And I suddenly realized, well, how do you store metal, you know, as ingots? So I then went through a process of breaking them apart and um, took them um, in, up to Wales, a, a rural part of the UK, and smelted them down into ingots mm -hmm. and um, embossed them all with uh, their name, either Harrier or Jaguar. So um, that, that was a sort of a way of being able to then index those, I suppose, and bring them, uh, sort of erase the image, but um, document the fact of them. Yeah. Do you see that as a publishing project in a way? In um, some ways, yeah. yeah. As you stamp them, right? Like a, in, like a yeah, like embossed, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. There was, did you have a, Quite, did someone ha was waiting for the microphone, maybe next to Barbara. Maybe it was someone. I thought I saw someone with their hand. Any last thoughts from? About okay. <laughs> about you being an uh, an ISBN, uh, how does that work? Do you do you have to uh, uh, send a copy of yourself to the library? Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a good, good question. question. <laughs> Um, so I did receive a letter asking for a copy of Fiona Banner for um, legal deposit. It's called a legal deposit. So um, I wrote back explaining that it was impossible to deposit myself and that this was a, an ongoing um, one-off performative publication and that I'd also published some other works which I discussed. So I, I published a stone once, which I published under, under the title of Sleep. Um, and a, a sort of uh, a rapport, a rather arch and formal rapport um, was enacted through letters between the British Library and, and myself and in the end I made a book which was um, titled by its own ISBN number so it had an ISBN number on the cover and inside the book were all the forms that I'd submitted for legal deposit and images of the work and I deposited that and gave that to the uh, British Library so yeah <laughs> I would say it's a piece of hardcore conceptual yeah. uh, art, no? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. <laughs> that's it too. That's, that's a majority. <laughs> Two out of three. I think it's. I think it's. <laughs> oh, sort of ma yeah, majority. Okay, so we both voted. It's it, <laughs> ultimately, um, the. That book contained images of quite a few uh, material, um, you know, factual objects. But in the end, the, the project's ephemeral. And yeah. that's why I wouldn't know whether it's appropriate to uh, call it conceptual art. I would say it's, yeah, performative. Con conceptual performance art? <laughs> Conceptual. <laughs> okay, uh, let's leave it. Let's leave it uh, there. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> okay. Well, if you don't shout here, give me the microphone, and I don't hear anybody, <laughs> then I think. Thank you very much for thank you. for coming. Thanks uh, thank for you coming. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you so much. So much. Thank you so much.